you asked me what I'm doing here in Barrow and Furnace on a cold February morning, the answer is, I've come to see a man about a ship. I represent the owners, my title, Hull Inspector. At the moment, there's no hull to inspect. An empty slipway and a plate or two are all there seems to be of a two million pound vessel. Today is the official date for keel laying. No flags, you notice, no ceremony. In fact, no keel. Actually, these plates are the equivalent of the old-fashioned keel. Not very sentimental, perhaps, but it's the modern way. To know about such things, where better than the shipyard manager's office? He and his kind have seen a good many vessels take shape through that window. His job is to see the hull is built to schedule and specification. Mine to keep in close touch with him at all stages of construction. Her specifications were not drawn up in Barrow, but in that place where so many unexpected things happen, the city of London. It's natural and understandable that the people who work in or visit this building should know something of oil, and even tankers. But quite a number would never realize that somewhere upstairs, ships are envisaged in considerable detail. There, in the offices of the British Tanker Company, the vessel in question was first agreed upon as one of a program. That done, her dimensions were decided on according to her route and the nature of her trade. Such items, too, as the most economical machinery, consistent with expected reliability. In the light of these technicalities, they planned the ship accordingly. In an adjoining room, detailed specifications were prepared ready for submission to various shipbuilders, together with an invitation to tender, all under the eye of the naval architect. A painstaking business, the first theoretical stages of something as yet non-existent. But one day, she'll be a ship, and so they've given her a name. Now, with contracts long agreed, work proceeds. Methods vary according to owner's requirements and the nature of the ship. Traditional techniques continue side by side with the revolutionary, and that's the right word. For in shipbuilding since the war, there's been a revolution, in its way as remarkable as the jet engine in aviation. There have been vast changes in construction techniques, so sweeping, in fact, that production processes and rhythms have had a complete overhaul. The root of such change is one thing, electric welding. By this process, shipbuilders can prefabricate large sections under cover, ready for assembly as soon as slipways become available. That's how a ship can change her appearance almost hourly. up to 40 tons in weight like this one can leave the shops. Such methods having proved themselves on technical and economic grounds. The quantity of steel in her hull alone, 7,500 tons with another 2,000 tons in all. Of course, everything moves along because of pre-planning. The modern closely allied with the traditional. Here in the mold loft, skill and experience are at work. A vast black floor, and on this immense blackboard, the lines of the vessel are chalked full size. Geometry plus great craft in application make it the nerve center of the shipyard. From the mold loft goes out a series of battens, molds and templates. Everything that goes into the vessel, 
from a bulkhead to the plates and curved stringers that run the length of the ship. That's the vital background to what's been going on outside. Wet or fine, the prefabricated sections keep swinging along into position. Incidentally, British Sovereign takes her name from one of the first vessels ever built for the owners. Her keel was laid during World War I. Just a little different in size, though. 32,000 tons compared with 5,800 tons. Her design identical with her sister ships included in the program. Not much noise of riveting these days. There's some, of course, even in this one. And in conjunction with the welding, it's regarded as highly important. Along the gunnel bar and several lines of hull plating, as well as in deck house structure near the standard compass. That stage isn't reached yet, but she gradually takes shape as pieces come together, big and small. Whether it be squeezing a frame into its appointed shape or the cold rolling of steel plates, precision, sureness, planning. Those are the touchstones by which men work to build a ship. She'll have 10 main cargo tanks. All in all are some 30 oil compartments. For the record, length 665 feet, breadth 85 feet 6 inches, depth 46 feet 8 inches. Tankers have their own special problems of design, of course, but any modern ship is a mighty complex piece of engineering with calculated strains and stresses from the smallest bracket to her prop. One day, not too far distant, that 26 and a half ton screw will be turning at anything up to 112 revs per minute, driving her through the waters of the Persian Gulf and other oceans far from Barrow. Now, with deck plates on, she's ready for a special kind of test. Throughout, she's built of steel under special survey to plans approved by Lloyd's Classification Society. To quote, she needs to be supplied with certificates for Class 100A1, carrying petroleum and its products in bulk. So now, with the representatives of Lloyd's, it's my job to be there when the oil compartments are tested for water tightness, or as we call it more precisely, oil tightness. Great attention has been paid to our oil tight bulkheads and her deck seams. Now, tested under pressure, the time has come to see whether everything's just so. Here goes. So far, so good. She's up to deck level. But if she's to meet her delivery date, another vital part of her must be keeping pace. Her engines are built here in the shipyard. For the technically minded, she's a single screw vessel driven by double reduction geared steam turbines, developing a service power of 12,500 shaft horsepower. If that doesn't mean much, let's put it this way. These turbines will be capable of driving her at a service speed, loaded, of 15 knots. You can't work in a shipyard and not ponder one miracle. You start with a mass of cold steel and suddenly she becomes a ship. The moment varies according to the individual. For me, it's early. For most, it's the launch. Well, that's not very far away. Under her keel, men are busy. Above, there's thousands of tons weight of steel built on the rake. 
the problem, in precise engineering terms, is how to drop those thousands of tons through a vertical distance of some 40 feet, with great and varying stresses tearing at her at every stage of her first and only journey overland towards the sea. The shipwrights will have laid fixed tracts of heavy timber, accurately set to the proper gradient, extending well down into the water. Special grease compounds will ease the journey of the sliding ways that carry the cradle built around the ship. You don't really launch a ship with a bottle. You do it by a lot of craft, experience and plain hard work. Just before high water, there's great last-minute activity. Wedges over keel and bilge blocks to be driven out and cleared away, last-minute touches of welding. For the last delicate task is to transfer the whole mass of the ship onto the ways. With 800 tons of chain to check her progress, soon she will be free to move. And now her moment comes. British Sovereign is about to join all ships already on the ocean. Now the business starts of getting her down channel to her fitting out basin. At this moment, when the cheers have died, I have one small and yet important task to do. A telegram to be sent to London. At 1.12 p.m., the British Sovereign was safely launched. A lot of confidence and cool experience lies behind the little word, safely. As long as those who work with ships include that word, no man will take a launching quite for granted. And soon, routine dictates another telegram. At 2.15 p.m., British Sovereign was safely berthed. That one, too, I can soon dispatch, for those responsible have done it. About this time in her history, you'll see another man upon the quay. Not her captain, her chief engineer to be. Without mincing words, he'd tell you that a hull without engines is for him a meaningless thing. And you'd gather forcefully something you tended to know before. Namely, that engines are very, very important. And he'll inform you, on the slightest provocation, that engines are not something you order overnight like a pound of margarine. Also, that as he's been informed that he is to spend the next few years of his life in close proximity to those engines, it is important that everything should be just so from the start. For him, she's not a project, but a place of work and a second home, afloat. I go aboard to join the army, an army of highly skilled tradesmen. Carpenters, joiners, cabinet makers, plumbers, tinsmiths, blacksmiths, fitters, painters. Chairs, fittings and towels. Everything from a roll of lint for the hospital to tea cloths for the galley. She's going to be a ship and a good one, with plenty of creature comforts. 
for a tanker spends little time in turn round and her crew consequently little time ashore. Stores and ropes, linen, lockers and lifeboats complete with sails. An intricate mass of specialized activity. Masts, rigging, deck fittings, wood decks to be laid, corked and paid with marine glue. A watertight doors to be tested. Time is getting close, so let's press on. Charwomen and French polishers, upholsterers, decorators, electricians, almost falling over each other to finish off a multitude of jobs. Now, indeed, she can call herself a ship. She's met her master. That's not just a sailor's joke. It's a fact, or will be soon. Two million pounds worth of brains and achievement are going to be placed in his hands. On him lies the final responsibility for her care and safety. This is his command. One thing remains. Whatever engines, here too, great activity, much final deliberation, for this is her heart. Soon it will be tested to the utmost. The compasses, gyro compasses of the latest type, also to be tested at sea and adjustment made if necessary. In addition, she'll have radar, wireless equipment, and direction finder and very high frequency telephone. On her bridge stands the man who technically is not yet her captain. As yet, she belongs to the builders. Only at the end of her trials will she be handed over. It looks like chaos, but it's not. It looks hopeless, but it never is. There's a date fixed for her trials, and these last few days are never any different. She'll be finished from the top of her funnel to every piece of piping on her deck. Down to her life, boys. She'll soon be ready for sea. shipmates meet, and it looks as if they've sailed together before. She'll have ten engineer officers, four deck officers under the master. Under him, too, there'll be a radio officer, four navigating apprentices, chief steward, 41 petty officers and ratings. All in all, a full complement of 62. This, the night before, is a busy time for all concerned. Tomorrow, British Sovereign sails at dawn. She's heading first for Belfast and then the Clyde and the measured mile. Not only her engines will be on trial, everything about her will be watched and noted. Her anchors to be tested, her steering, compasses. On her bridge, pilot and shipyard representatives work side by side. She's ready for her anchor trials. behind her, she can proceed.
measured mile is coming up, and she's away. On the shore are two white posts that mark the measured mile. So let's wish her luck. That's it. All seems well. Down below, there's quite a party. The owners and the shipyard representatives now go through the formality of handing over. The shipyard flag is struck, and in its place is broken that of the owning company. British Sovereign, approved and tested, is a ship in every meaning of the word. Very soon, she'll be off to earn her keep, from Kent to Kuwait, from Scotland down to Aden. From the boy who brought the tea, to her captain himself, all will wish her well. You can't help it with a ship, for she's a brave and lively thing.